Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on the theme of talent assessments, remote team bonding, hiring, and PIP performance improvement plan. We are super excited for you to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. And we're really excited to welcome David Russell uh, to today's webinar alongside Jeffrey Tabelli, our president and CEO. So my name is Esther. I'm the operations manager here at RCS Professional Services. We are an IT managed service provider servicing small and medium-sized businesses in New York Tri-State and Atlanta, Georgia. So just before we begin, I wanted to just mention a couple of housekeeping um, things. If you have any questions or insights or thoughts throughout, we would love to hear them. We would love to welcome your feedback and questions. Please use the, the chat box um, on your control panel to ask these and or use the little raise hand button to let us know you have a question. We'll be happy to stop um, and answer all your questions. David's really looking forward to um, engaging with you guys over the course of this webinar. So really happy to have you here. Right now I have you all muted just for the sake of being able to uh, to address everyone's questions and um, speak. But again, feel free to let us know you have questions or comments um, in, that, in that way. So without further ado, I'm about to introduce Jeffrey Tabelli. Jeffrey is our president and CEO since uh, 1999 when we became RCS and before. Um, hey, Jeffrey, how are you? Hey, what's up? Good to see you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having yeah. us. Uh, it's great to Bye. see you on, on screen. <laughs> so without further ado, Jeffrey's going to speak a little bit about our experiences uh, with David Russell, and then we'll be happy to get right into it. So sure. take it away, so, Jeff. Thanks. As, as Esther mentioned, RCS Professional Services is an IT managed service provider. We help clients basically leverage technology in their business to make them spectacular. Um, there's a lot that can be uh, uh, attain from investing in technology, especially in doing it the right way, and it could become a weapon in your business. Not that I'm anything uh, violent or anything like that, but you know, you want to win in business. So uh, we were fortunate enough five years ago to run into David Russell, and he kind of did the same thing for us, but on the people side of the business. So you know, we implemented a lot of his um, great stuff. Uh, we we established our core values in our company. We started attracting talent that aligned with our core values. We implemented disk assessments, which is something that changed my life. Uh, we have another webinar on that coming up in a month. Basically, behavioral styles of people and how um, you could communicate more effectively and efficiently. And it just really changed uh, our organization for the better and helped our bottom line. So without further ado, David Russell. Uh, who is a wealth of information on this topic, and he really knows his stuff. So uh, take a listen. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Esther and Jeff, for having me on. Uh, we are going to kind of work with a presentation in the background, but I want to encourage the audience. You came here because you had a specific problem or issue or question. Uh, just dive in and, and put questions in the chat. And we'll answer them as we go. I'm not going to save them till the end. So I've encouraged Jeff to interrupt me as much as he wants, although he's super polite. So I don't that. know how, how much he will. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, let, let's let's dive in. Let's There's some content. I'm trying to keep it fairly succinct and give you high value. But my background is I've got 47 years business experience. If you go all the way back to when I was uh, using my pickup truck and doing gardening and hauling stuff to the dump and Going from there, been very entrepreneurial, made some mistakes. Um, uh, in 2002, um, had the epiphany that, hey, I have leadership attributes, but no skills, and started a journey to really study leadership and develop systems for what I call the four management disciplines, how you hire, how you manage, how you develop, and how you retain. And this whole COVID thing in the economy and other things happening in America and worldwide have made 2020 quite a memorable year. So there's some changes, there's some things to do differently. And so let's dive in and, and have some conversation in these three areas of um, how we look at it as team bonding, you know, talent yeah. assessments, because talent assessments about getting to know yourself and your team better, and then in hiring and then with the performance improvement plans. Right, and and just to touch on that, you touched on the whole COVID thing and everyone's working from home. Like if we didn't make those investments five years ago, and it takes time to really do it in terms of defining your core values and hiring people that align with them and letting go of people that don't, um, 
a lot of the technology, yes, it helps and all that stuff, but really without the right people that are, are aligned with what you're trying to do and how you tick, um, it just makes it so much easier to be effective. We've been working remotely from home um, without even being in the office together. And I don't think we really skipped a beat. I really, I really attribute that to the investments we made in the whole core values thing that you helped us with. Yeah, and I think that's an important piece. So um, we're gonna focus a little bit on talent assessments here. And as you see, and can you see my screen okay, Jeff? I, Jeffrey, am I? Yeah. That's good? Yeah. Okay. So um, before I go into this group exercise, I, I think you're bringing up a good point. And notice how we're doing this. We're saying, okay, first of all, you've got to take care of your existing people. We need them fully engaged in meaningful work they, they feel they're valued, they know what they're trying to do and how they're held accountable. There's a lot of nuances to that. But you brought up what I call company culture uh, cornerstones. So there's four cornerstones when you have a building that you want to be solid. And most people, when they think of culture, they think of mission, why, we're, why are we in business? Vision, where are we gonna go or grow as an organization? And values. How do we do business? But that's three cornerstones. If you only have three, your home's on tilt, your business on tilt, the building, and that's a problem. So um, what people are missing is the fourth. I mean, Bernie Madoff had some great values and they were in bronze on the building, okay? And the fourth one, it's what's, it's what's missing, it's accountability to live them out. So that right. means, first of all, leaders are role models for those company culture cornerstones and then they engage people so that they're living out the values also. And there's some simple ways to do that. Jeffrey, remember how we, we talked about that, where you know, it's your team meetings. You may say, okay, give me an example of how you lived out one of our values this past right. week or this past month. Right, we do yeah. that in that weekly yeah. meeting now, every week for a few years now. And uh, we have each, each employee reads one of the core values and then they read like the long explanation of one of them each week. And we try and like, align a story that happened that week with, with the values. So it's definitely alive and it's, it's really helped us a lot. And it's kind of like kids, you just got to keep saying it and saying it and saying it because new people come into the organization and if you're not talking about it all the time, it, it goes away and it, it just it's out of sight, out of mind. Well, that's right. And, and it doesn't work when it's just on the wall, but when you take that approach, then what happens is when you're not around, they're going to have decisions to make and they're going to think, what do I do? And they're going to instinctively, it's a habit, think, okay, what are our values? Because if I get called on this, I can say, well, I made this decision because of our value of X. And that's exactly what you want them to do. Yeah. And I so, love that I know you'll get into it, like how you made employee report cards and they had to like, you know, get scored on each of the values. Like, and then you could really see who doesn't, fit in the organization and, and kind of like works their way out on their own. I loved how you did that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it, you know, it's part of your annual performance review. You need to give them feedback, how they lived out your mission, their, your vision, and each one of your values. Um, they need that feedback. Ideally, you're giving that feedback more often, uh, maybe quarterly, in addition to your discussions. But the other thing is that leaders need to say when they're making decisions or it's a group discussion, you need to say, well, Based on our value of X, I think we need to do Y. And that'll help people understand that's how we make decisions around here. But if the leaders aren't doing that, then it's just on the wall. Nobody yeah. knows it. You got to make it alive. Yeah. So when you think about that piece, then what I'm, the reason we're talking about talent assessments today is not to sell you something. As a matter of fact, I'll give you one for free if you've never tried one of ours before. I'll give you our highest priced one. It's a triple assessment. It looks at behaviors, how you do things. It looks at driving forces, which is why you do things. And the why actually pushes the how. And then it assesses 25 soft skills or competencies uh, where you are maturity wise in those and really helps you to get to know yourself better. And the goal is not to look at where to whack you, where you're weak or one of your team members, but to look at, okay, where are you strong? And how can you make that stronger? And then yeah. where are the areas you need improvement? And usually there's one or two key areas there, not a laundry list of 17. All right. 
and you you say, okay, well, what can I do differently here? What's a new habit I can develop to overcome the bad habit? Yeah, also, when you gave that to me, and again, it changed my life, um, I learned that I just shouldn't be doing certain things in our organization because it's just so uncomfortable for me. And it's just, it's the last thing I want to do. And as a result, the company suffers. So really for the past five years, we've been working on filling those gaps and taking them off and the Esther being one of them and, you know, uh, many others in the organization. And it just was eye opening and what a revelation it was for me. I got to tell you. Well, the other thing is, then you enjoy coming to work more, don't you, Jeff? Totally. Every day is paradise. <laughs> yeah, so there's an MSP, a guy who started his business from scratch in SoCal. Zach Schuler started CalNEC Technology Group, right. and he sold out a few years ago. And um, he was on the podcast, on my podcast a while ago, and he said he lived by the 80% rule. So what that meant was that if his team member was doing 80% of what he would do, not work quantity, but right. quality. Right. That he wouldn't nitpick it. Right. And so, so he had clear metrics to follow up on because you have to do that. You can't delegate and then no right. follow up. Crazy. So so I'm like, I don't know if you can explain that this stuff at all, but like I'm like ultra high C. I don't know if you remember, which basically means I, <laughs> I'm a perfectionist uh, off the charts, and yeah. I grew up. Uh, listening to the term, like, if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. That is the worst line I ever ingested and lived by, because, especially with me, because that's evil within me. I basically went nowhere for so many years because I just wanted to do everything myself because I didn't, I didn't like the results that other people would do. So rather than working on letting them make a mistake and improving it, I would do it myself and I would work on the stupidest little things. So, you know, <laughs> That was what you gave to me. So thanks for that gift. You 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 threw that line out of my life. Well, that, I mean, it's it just I had to learn it the hard way myself. Uh, there's the story about the the grocery store manager who's stocking shelves, and he's asked, "Well, why are you doing that instead of one of your people?" He says, "Well, I just do it better." Same type <laughs> of thing. Zach Schuler did something with his his uh, CEO that he had, and uh, great guy, the CEO. CEO came up and asked him a question. And Zach went and clutched his chest and he fell to the floor. And oh, yeah. his CEO said, what are you doing? And Zach said, I'm dying. I'm dead. You got to figure out what to do on your own. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, you know, then he, he told him, he said, look, that's something you have the responsibility to do. And I right. trust you. Right. As long as you're making the decision based on our values, you know, we have a good working relationship. You can make the decision. Don't worry right. about it. Right. And it frees right. Zach up to grow the business. I mean, he grew the business up to 80, 90 employees. Nice. I mean, it's huge by the time he sold out. I think it was a 17-year run or something. So nice. um, yeah. it helped. Hope, yeah, hopefully. And maybe you could touch on the tools that help you, you know, hold people like on that note, right? But if the guy or gal can't do it as good as, you know, the boss, how do we get them there? You have tools to help solve well, that problem, right? Well, that's right. So this group exercise, the talent assessments, we did those at CalNet with Zach's group, all, all the people, and then he would use them in hiring constantly. Right. And uh, it was very successful for them. And so if we're talking now, remember what, what I said earlier, I said, we want to stay focused on where our, our existing people, and, and by the way, um, do we have any questions so far? Anybody got a question so far? Because we have been, you know, going through a variety of stuff. Call those I out. And... I don't see any questions just yet. Um, if anyone has any, feel free to drop them in the chat or use the little raise hand button. But um, if we don't see anything yet, I think we're good. Uh, we're all sitting here waiting for the secret sauce. So, David, <laughs> do you take us, take us inside. <laughs> I know I'm okay, sitting so here on the edge of my chair. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to actually walk you through some things because, quite frankly, we've we've updated some things since I worked with you guys, still consistent with what we did before. But right. so taking the assessment um, and then we create uh, summaries because the assessment reports are 50 to 60 pages long. Right. We create a summary. We ask people to go in afterwards and only on certain pages, highlight one to three statements that best describe them. Because when I'm looking at 14 statements that uh -huh. pretty accurately describe someone, that's too much for me to remember. Right. 
But if the person says, hey, you want to work well with me, you want to communicate well with me, do these one, two, or three things. So the summaries are just the highlighted statements and the key graphs. The cubicle signs are, if we ever get back to working together in one office, you can at a glance see, oh, this is that person's most intense behaviors, and this is what most intensely drives them. I need to adapt how I'm going to communicate to them based on what I see on this side. Totally, totally. And on the yeah. customer side too, right? Like you could kind of sense what a, what, what a client's going to behave like and then react accordingly. Well, it's, it's interesting, although you most, I, I don't think I've had anybody yet, but you could ask clients to take these um, <laughs> as part of what you wanted. But when you use them regularly and you apply what you learn, yeah. you sense some of the attributes in other people. You're like, oh, you must be a high C like Jeffrey. <laughs> where you got these super high standards and you want to do it once and do it right and there's perfectionism there so i need right. to be aware of that when i communicate right. with you i need to give you a lot of data and facts not say yeah i think this is okay because that'll right. drive you nuts right jeffrey totally totally i've been analyzing just since he sent it that's what we, you know <laughs> that's right. we've been using them we've been using do you want to explain this or go in a different direction no i'll, I'll go there in a moment i'll go there in a moment so so this exercise, though, is everybody takes them, um, they complete the three steps. We have three steps. It's not just doing the online survey. We create these summaries, and then I do a custom presentation. You may remember that. Yeah. One piece is I actually teach how you read the report, and we customize it a little bit with your people's information. And then I walk through everybody's key graphs. So right. everybody sees this is this person's most intense behaviors, and these are their most intense driving forces and there's laughter people love it they're like oh that's why you behave that way yeah. and they learn they learn things that they can apply and throughout the training i encourage please notice people's strengths starting with your own and the other people and then also maybe one or two areas of weakness because you need to be aware of that with yourself so you can build on the strengths and address the weakness, but also with the other people so you can communicate more effectively and efficiently with them yeah. and you'll enjoy working with them better. I mean, there's a story years ago, it wasn't me, it was another consultant that uses our same ass assessments who is a great gal, uh, super talented in this area, but she went into a, a company. There was a woman who was in sales. There was a woman who was a tech. And the woman in sales walked over to the tech one day and they didn't get along very well. And she said, look, I've got this prospect and they're really interested in our product and they want this and this and this and this and this. Can we do it? No response. And the salesperson felt like she had waited for eternity. She turned and walked <laughs> away. I'm, I'm never gonna make any money in this company. Everybody hates me. Nobody likes me. This is awful. And they called in this consultant who's a friend of mine. And she had both these women take this assessment. And it was like, oh, the tech was just thinking. Right. She was a high C like you, Jeffrey. So she's like, yeah. she doesn't want to give the wrong answer. And let me guess, the salesman was a high D? You got it. Salesperson's a high D. <laughs> the funny thing is, the, the high D wants an answer yesterday. Okay. Right. No There's page. no problem too big. And if I don't solve this, I'm going to miss out. There'll never be another right. opportunity like this. All right. So, so the funny thing is the high D came up with the solution even before the consultant could make a suggestion. Right. And so the next time she had a similar opportunity, she walked over to the tech and she said, okay, I got this prospect. They want this and this and this and this and this. I'll come back in 15 minutes. And she turned and walked away. And these two women not only became really effective, efficient, and enjoyed working with each other then because they respected each other's differences, instead of those differences irritating them, they became close personal friends. Right. They were hanging out outside of work. Right. That's Even what in, we're looking for. in life, like my, like marriage, family, like it, 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 it hits everywhere, really. It does. And, you know, with clients who buy one of these, I tell them, I tell the leaders, I say, hey, if you'd like to have your spouse take the assessment, I'll give you one for free. And then yeah. I'll walk the two of you through it so you can understand where your differences are and where you're in sync. And you'll see in a moment, um, I don't do this for them typically, um, but we have some tools to even show that. So let me just dive in. Uh -huh. This is the disc. So this is how our report does the disc. 
and uh, not a person's actual name, Bob Garbonzo, but I kind of like that name. Um, but you can see the way our assessment does it, you get two key graphs here on the left that are vertical graphs. On the right-hand side, it says your natural style. So that's how you behave outside of work. Or if you're under a lot of pressure on the job, you're going to revert to that. Okay. And then on the right hand, on the left hand side, the adaptive style is how you're trying to adapt your behaviors on the job. Now, this person, no real significant changes. Right. It's 100% scale. There's no right or wrong. High scores aren't better than low scores, but they're just different. So you shift from one style of the behavior to the next. Now, this profile, the D is dominance, how you handle problems and challenges. And so this person is a situational D. They tend to be on the low side. So they tend to think things through before they do them. But mm -hmm. because they're in that situational area, they can move faster to solve problems if they need to. Totally. The I is influencing how you interact with other people. The simple way to look at it is high eyes and extrovert, low eyes and introvert. This person, I can put them in a room with 300 people for four hours and they will come out of that room energized and be everybody's new best friend and not remember anybody's name right i have a few friends like that and they're quite successful that's right that's right however jeffrey i, I didn't look at yours before this uh, uh, this meeting although i should have uh, but you're probably on the low eye spectrum and when people are really low like they're below 20 or even below 10 all right you know, they've got one two three friends they've had for a lifetime Right. But they don't have this broad net of friendships that aren't deep, but they're broad. And right. if they were in that room for, for four hours with 300 people, they would come out exhausted, even <laughs> if they sat in the corner and didn't talk to anybody. Right. I'm actually like uh, decent on the eye chart, not like super chart, somewhere around the 50 yard line over there. But my, oh, okay. D, my D is like a one, the red one. And my, <laughs> my blue one, which is the C, is like a 99. And my yes. green one yeah. is like 87. So like that's me yeah. basically. Okay, yeah, so I could have brought yours up. I should ask for permission, um, but yeah. you can. Um, yeah, so basically when you have someone who's super high S, high C, um, they don't particularly like deadlines. They'll miss a deadline to make certain they're right because it's more important to be right than to be on time. Right. Um, and they have super high standards and they believe in process. You got to follow process. And um, I mean, you have reasonably good soft skills where you're nice, but some people that are high S to and high C's, their soft skills are really not good. They're really, um, they can be very curt, uh, abrupt, direct. Um, I had one guy who was a high C like you and I asked him, I said, so my understanding is, High C's have trouble admitting mistakes. Is that difficult for you? And he said, well, it, it wouldn't be a problem if I ever made one. Right. So that's another yeah. thing that that uh, I learned to like understand that I have, which is like always trying to prove that I'm right and never being wrong. You know, like always, always be wanting to be the guy in the room that has the right answer. And I was yeah. able to let that go after this, which was awesome because why not have you know, our, our great people who do it better than me do it, basically. So that's been awesome. Yeah. yeah. So this is helpful. And, and when you're in this group setting as a team bonding exercise, you know, people really say, oh, that's why you're that way. <laughs> and I tell you, I have not been in a team setting in a very long time where someone, you know, um, and I've never had somebody say that the report was wrong, totally wrong. There were just occasionally when you have that super high S, they're skeptics. And so there have been times when I had people who have been super high S's, and so they're skeptical of the results. They don't say they're wrong, but they're skeptical. But so everybody really likes it. Then you move on to the driving forces. This is the why you do things. And we look for intensity. And I'm not gonna walk you through all this because we only have so much time, but I do want you to notice that in this chart, there are four intense scores. So it's 100% scale. In the upper right is a 90 for the intellectual. That is someone who loves to learn. They'd be a lifelong student if they could afford to be, love to learn a variety of ways. And if you go diagonally down to the lower left-hand corner, the receptive, you see they're a 92. Wow. So 
that's somebody who wants to consider options. So more than likely, this person is extremely smart, loves to learn, but what they have to watch out for is are they learning just enough to get done what they need to get done? Or are they saying, oh, this is really cool and they're wasting an additional hour, four hours a day, a week right. because they go down this learning path and they have to make certain they're learning things that they can apply and work, not just learning because they love to learn. Right. So it could become a time waste, do you say? Exactly. It's a good team member, but they have to understand this about themselves right. so they can monitor it and put some boundaries in place. Then you look at um, the fourth down on the left, intentional 83. That's someone who's a hard worker. They come to work to work. They work with other people to get things done. Right. Um, and so that's a good trait. That's a results oriented driving right. force in our mind. And then resourceful, the second one down on the right, there are 74. Um, they are driven by achieving results and or making money. And it's right. usually achieving results. So this is a top performer, but they do have to watch that learning piece and considering too many options right. as a time waster. Gotcha. So that's that's where this helps them. Make sense? Yeah, totally. Okay. And then we have something that's newer since we worked with you is we do this test of 25 soft skills. And so they get ranked as well-developed, which is the dark blue, mm -hmm. developed, which is the next blue color there. Um, somewhat, what is it? Um, it's not somewhat developed, but it's, it's some other qualification there. You can see in the teamwork one. And then there's one more qualification that is needs development. Right. And right. so we can talk about this and we can look at this. And this it's is helpful. Like, so uh, strengths finder. I, I did strengths finder once, I think after I worked with you, but yeah, somewhat, somewhat, I think. But the beauty about this is that when you do this assessment, this is our triple pr pr perspective. When you do this assessment, it blends all this data, and these PhDs have these algorithms that bring forth statements that really help you understand how to become your best. Right. and where there's a weakness or two that you need to address. So it's it's very, very helpful. Make right. sense? Yeah, totally. Okay, audience, don't be shy. Ask questions if you want. Now, I've got this information. What do I do with it? First thing I do is I'm going to show the team, and this was a large company. I blocked the names. This is a large company I show. So when we look at the behaviors, those adapted behaviors, where does everybody fall? How well do we balance? This company's pretty balanced. Mm -hmm. You can see as far as this wheel here where things are plotted. Right. And of course, we use larger, you know, yeah, icons that's... or whatever when there's fewer people. This was a, a big group. But you can see, and this gives us insights also as far as where people are. And it also gives us insight. See the inside there, the 57, 58, 59, 60 in the middle there. Mm -hmm. You can see three people fell in there. Those people have to watch out because they are so flexible, easygoing that they will take on too much and then struggle with deadlines. Right. So we give them some good insights that, hey, you need to be aware of this. Right. It doesn't necessarily show up in the standard DISC behavioral right. profile. But in this wheel is where it shows up so we can help them be aware of that and then teach them some habits to overcome the bad habits. Cool. Next, here's a you know the start of a summary report. You can see what I've got here is those statements here. I used my own because I didn't want to put somebody's up that um, might embarrass them or whatever. If you're a high D, I would never think you're a high D. Yeah, I'm a high D. The thing that surprises people is I'm a low I. I'm introverted. Yeah, I would think you, I would I would not put you as a high D. I, I guess I guess behind the curtain it's different. Well, I'm I'm much easier on other people than I am on myself. <laughs> so, and the other thing about the high D to keep in mind is the high D is a problem solver. For sure. So I, I I you can put me in any situation and I will try to solve the problem not necessarily by myself. I'll put together a team. For instance, I could I could be president of the United States and put together a team and solve the problem. I wouldn't right. ever want to be president, so don't quote me on that. That's the worst job in the world. 
but <laughs> um, but I'm intrigued by the problems. You know, right. we'd love to solve the problems because people are getting hurt. The summary report is an opportunity for your team because we recommend, as you remember, all this information should be available to everybody on the team. Right. If they're about to meet with someone and they think it's going to be a difficult meeting, they can look at the summary report or the full talent assessment and say, okay, what do I need to remember about this person so that I'm going to communicate information so it's well received, they consider it, and we can work well together. Right. And so in here, you can see there's statements where I've said, this is the way to communicate with me, to work with me. And it's extremely helpful. And then the front page of that summary report is actually a cubicle sign. So you notice this is an update from when we worked with you, Jeff. Yeah, we think we gotta get this. Yeah, so these are, well, it's time, it's been five years, so you guys should really update, <laughs> uh, update your assessments. But so on the left-hand side, we list all four behaviors, where they are, but we list them in order of intensity. So that 50% energy line in the middle, uh -huh. we list the one that's farthest away from that and the one that's second farthest away from that. So you notice my two most intense, one is a high score, one is a low score. Right. So right. that lets people know my intensity on the behavioral side. And then on the driving forces, it's 100% scale. Look, I've got a 99 and I've got a 90. 99 my 71 is pretty high too, but but 99 out of 100, you can't go much higher. Gotcha. If you were to name like famous people uh, for each uh, letter, what would what would you use? I would say Trump's a, a high D. More than likely, Trump is a high D. Yeah, because <laughs> he has no filter on his mouth, and um, he's he's very driven. Right. That he likes. And, and, and we do that, by the way, in the training, in the custom training we do with the team right. is one point is we say, OK, here are famous people and two people of your team. Which famous person and which person on your team is a high D? Right. And we do and that with high D, high, high I, high S, high C. Only it's I fun. People love high it. I, would we say like a Jerry Seinfeld maybe or what would you say? Um, Seinfeld, actually, I think we have Seinfeld on there. I think he's viewed as a high S. Really? Yeah. And um, one of the things we have on there that's interesting is we say the characters of Robin Williams. And he, the characters of Robin Williams, I think, might be a high I. I'm not sure, but I don't want to give away. We actually, the two famous people are not Robin or uh, Seinfeld. They're actually... A, two other people that are on there that are pretty easy to figure out but you got to remember what a high eye is that they're an extrovert so and then also notice that this cubicle sign which is meant to be at a glance i know how to work with this person we have the person the third step of our assessment process is what three highlighted statements that you, you know the statements you highlighted best describe you you're only going to tell somebody three things about how to work with you what are they and that's what we have at the top here to right. remind them. And it's it's extremely helpful. Totally, totally. Hey, David. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you there. I just have a couple of comments and questions I wanted to uh, put out there. Um, so first came from um, Helen. I'll just use your first name. We also did this among our staff, and it was very interesting to see that people were rated in ways we did not expect. Pretty awesome. Um, that's awesome. And then we have one from Kim. This is a good question. Where does an employee fit? Who does not like to be managed? Well, that's a pretty broad question because <laughs> I don't know the context of, of your business. Um, so first of all, an employee that does not like to be managed, there, there's, it depends how extreme you want to go there. So if somebody doesn't want to be micromanaged, that's reasonable. And you can set up the metrics that they need to achieve and define the behaviors. We do something, remember you guys, in your employee strategic plans, where there's written expectations between manager and employee. So the manager says, these are the behaviors I want from you to perform well in the position. There should be some standard ones for the position, but also some that are unique to the individual, possibly that you've learned through the assessment. Secondly, the employee gets to say, here's what I want from you, Mr. or Mrs. Manager, so that you're the best boss I've ever had. And so you remove assumptions and you get on the same page in agreement of these are the behaviors we agree that we're going to exhibit and 
how we're going to work together. Um, you still need metrics. You need agreement on the behaviors. Um, if, so if it's micromanaging, you know, you should be able to work that out. If this is someone who just wants no management at all, um, quite frankly, you've got an issue and you need to talk with them because they're not only going to be a poor performing employee, because even if they're a superstar, they're going to violate rules. But they're also going to be a poor leader for the same reason. They're not going to be a role model for other people and they're not going to play well with other people. So there's something going on in their life experience that has led them to have certain behaviors where they're saying, you know, I don't want to be managed at all. That's obviously going to be a problem, but hopefully it's not that situation and you can work it out. All right. Also on the flip side, like you mentioned micromanagement, since that's me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, to get away from that as a manager, it, it took me years. I still struggle with it, but um, it could be the other side uh, applying force, right? That's right. That's right. So, I mean, the, the way to get away from micromanagement as a boss, one, one piece of the puzzle is typically micromanagers don't have good metrics or when they have good metrics, they don't do a good job training yeah. and, and mentoring. So if you invest the time and develop systems and processes, even record yourself for training things that you have to ultimately train multiple people over the years, you can reuse those trainings and you get people trained and developed so they can take on more. Totally. Um, and then you manage by the metrics. Totally. David, is it also true that if you have all the uh, other pieces in place with the culture, like Jeff was saying earlier, that sometimes that itself, if, if the culture is strong and everyone's moving in the same direction, cuts out the, the other people by default, sometimes they'll leave on their own because they just don't fit. Or maybe it was Jeff who was saying that earlier. Yes, yes, there are. And, and by the way, I, I really think relationships are first. Business decisions are second. But you have to understand. So if I'm going to let somebody go, even if they've done something terrible, I'm going to try to treat them respectfully and empathetically, but my boundaries are going to be firm. I have this new thing I've developed in the last two years. I call it good cop leadership style. It's, it's built off of good cop, bad cop negotiation style. So the good cop's always the nice person. The bad cop's going to break your kneecaps if you don't do what they, what they say. And so as a good cop leader, you are always coming alongside. You're not doing the pointing the finger. You're not doing, you're doing this and the blame game and the whack-a-mole. You're saying, hey, uh, we had agreed on this. And the thing you agreed to is the bad cop. The metrics are the bad cop. The client right. expectations are the bad cop. How you're hurting people is the bad cop. Correct. And you say, I'm sorry, our boundary is firm here. You cannot right. violate that. And no, respectfully, empathetically, you hold the boundary, and if necessary, you say, I'm sorry, but we have to transition you out, or we have to let you go, or this has to improve, and you're on a 90-day PIP, which we're going to talk about at the end. Yeah, Thank that's so all. Much. Sorry, go ahead, Esther. Oh, no, go ahead. I had another question. So no, I was going to say, Devin. like, on that note, like, I'm also a really high S, which means I, and Dave knows what it means better than me, but to me, it means I avoid confrontation, and I really... Yeah want to be harmonious with everyone around me so if someone's breaking the rules i'm probably not going to say anything unless i just lost my limit which is once a year um but like you said having the accountability where there's a report card that could be the bad cop also helps me uh bat, you know with that high s component like a, a high d wouldn't have a problem saying what the heck i told you not to do this why did why'd you do it you fired like you know like i i'm not that guy uh, but the accountability piece could help keep that in check for me. Well, that's right. And the funny thing is about the high D, sometimes they won't fire him. They'll just yell at him. <laughs> true, true. They'll they, just they, yell at him and threaten him, but they won't fire him. Right, right. It actually <laughs> helps nobody. <laughs> they're afraid of the confrontation, but they still don't right. want to pull the trigger because they don't want to go to the trouble to fill the seat. They're hoping if they just beat him up verbally, that then they'll turn around and they don't have to find somebody else because that's a pain. They don't want to go through that. Right. I once had like this high D client and like the amount of turnover that the guy, thank God we don't work with them anymore, but the amount of turnover that they had in their company was just insane. Like you would just let people go, but people would leave like within minutes. 
And I'm like, I don't know how this guy runs this company. And it was growing at the time. I just, I couldn't fathom it. I didn't understand it. Yeah, yeah. I actually Another worked question? With, yeah, we have oh. one more question. I would say I, I actually worked for somebody uh, like that. And I found out I lasted two weeks, which I found out was, was one week and five days longer than the four people in the month before me. <laughs> Uh, so I'm extra grateful for, for a boss like Jeffrey. Um, so we have a question from Nick. Uh, can you share some of the common metrics to manage remote work? The metrics to manage remote work, well, it really depends on your business. So one thing you have to have an understanding is, okay, are you tracking hours worked or are you tracking productivity? Because they can be very different things. So uh, remote work is kind of interesting. A lot of studies have come out and said one of the problems is that when you have good employees, they're working too much. Um, another challenge you have is that their kids at home and they're doing remote schooling, it's interrupting. So the metrics you need to look at is, is what are important for your business. So obviously in sales, you have number of calls, you have number of contracts, you have number of proposals, you have you know number of presentations, whatever those types of things, it's pretty straightforward. Um, this is where it comes back to writing very clear, measurable goals. I have a um, an ebook on that. Maybe um, Esther and Jeff, we do a follow up within two weeks, say before year end. I'm doing a rewrite on that. I'd rather give you the rewrite than give you sure. it the way it is today, and then the update. And I'm doing an update on the three strands leadership. My method, also uh, hopefully during the same time frame, so you could send those two ebooks out to help people. Um, awesome. But, but the main thing is if you're going to, the metrics that you want to look at is that they are clear and measurable. Yeah. And you teach how to write clear and measurable goals. We call them targets because everything you're trying to do is to get from point A to point B. So we talk about a target being a target destination. And then you have map meetings. So we also have a good guide on that. I don't have to update that if you want me to send that out. Um, but map meetings can be brief huddles daily, uh, no more than five or 15 minutes, depends on whether you're doing individual or group. And mm -hmm. then um, once a week, you follow that map format. And by the way, this map format works in professional meetings as well as personal. So the map is, remember, I'm going from point A to point B. I need a map to get from point A to point B. M is metrics. So what are those metrics? And metrics can be, you know, how many billable hours they're supposed to do, right. you know, each day or, or whatever it might be. But they also can be, hey, you committed to do this yesterday. So the metrics are, let's start the meeting by reviewing what we committed to in the past, whether right. that's yesterday or the week before, or the month before, or whatever. So we have accountability, respectful, empathetic, but firm accountability. You're there to help. So you, the M in the map is metrics. Then you move to adjustments, the A, and that's present. So we go from past to present. Well, present. So what do you got going on now? What problems do you have? Any questions you have? By the way, are you aware this is happening? And you talk about the presence. Now, as you go through the past and the present, the M and the A, the map, uh, excuse me, the metrics and the adjustments, you're defining the future, which is the plan. That's the P in map. So you walk through and at the end of the meeting, you say, okay, here's what we agreed that we're gonna be doing and here's our plan. And you confirm the plan and then you're, you're off and running. And the next time you meet, you pick it up, you run the cycle again. And so the metrics are a key piece, right. but to be candid with you, I suggest it is the consistency of your meetings and how well you manage those short little meetings um, that really drives the engagement of the employee and when they're engaged, they'll produce at the level you want, assuming you have good people in those positions. Right, and it's all it's all impossible without the, the job scorecard or whatever you call it in, in your world, but really, and that's where technology comes into play because it's really impossible to get a lot of these metrics without you know these software, whatever system it may be. If you're measuring number of dials, number of meetings, number of contacts, number of you know tickets closed, number of opportunities created, whatever it is, it's not easy to get those metrics without systems. And to do it all by paper and a, and a piece of paper on a desk, it just becomes impossible and it's a huge time waster. So I think you kind of need one to have the other. 
Well, that's true. And and Jeffrey, I'm sure your company is good at, you know, because you've worked with clients, you can go in, ask questions about the business, and you identify bottlenecks um, where a process can be automated or the way files are being accessed can be changed. So instead of waiting 15 minutes for a file to download that's a high-res image, you know, they're getting it in, in 20 seconds or something. Right. Um, whatever it might be. So technology today is part of the play to be efficient, um, but it's also part of the play to manage the metrics. Um, yes. We have what we call employee strategic plans. They're basically a job description on steroids. They are a success plan for every employee. We have not built them into software yet, um, but there are parts of it like the goals that can be used in various apps. Um, but it's really your habits and your processes around that managing piece. So the, the four management disciplines I mentioned, how you hire, manage, develop, and retain, mm -hmm. that management piece comes down to how frequently you meet and how efficient those meetings are related to the metrics that you've mutually agreed on. You don't just, you're not Moses coming down from the hill with the, the tablets, okay? When you're setting goals, ideally, you're talking with the employee and they're right. defining the draft right. and then you're helping them finalize the draft because when they write their draft goals or their metrics, their objectives, their tasks, they own them more than when you tell them what to do all the time. Yeah, you're reminding me that we have a lot of improvement to do here, so thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> Anything else, Esther, or should we move on? Yeah, go ahead and move on. You got uh, a little shout out from someone in uh, EO. Uh, he says, hello. And he says, David is great. Um, this is Nick. Dave came to our retreat in North Carolina. So thanks for the comment, Nick Irustin. Ir Ir Sorry if I said that wrong. Oh, cool. Uh, that's great. Good to hear from you. Thanks, Nick. Okay, this is new. So this is something, if I want to compare two or three people, this is three people. Let's say I got three people on a team. And I want them to understand where they're like and where they're different. This is the behaviors. I, I use those red circles to show some differences. So you look at these three people. If you look at Bob and Graham on the left and on the right, they're similar in the D and the S. Okay? So I point that out. And then if you look at the person in the middle there, Shamrock, Shamrock also shares their high Ds. So you got three people on this team. They're all high Ds. Okay? But you need to note that although uh, there's there's varying degrees of the I, the influencing, Shamrock is a massive introvert. Look at that, single digits, a seven. How so is that Shamrock, possible to be like a high D and a low I? Like, uh, it seems weird. Not weird in a it's, bad way. It's not, I wouldn't say possible. weird. It's, it's not as common. Uh-huh. It just means you have a very driven person who's fairly analytical. I mean, they're good on analytical. They uh -huh. force themselves to follow process, but they're very task oriented. Right. Okay. And so they're happy going through a day without talking to anybody. Right. Um, and so you look at this and you can also take it a step further and put some circles down in the tables below to kind of show where some similarities are. But this is, this is a helpful thing. And then, we do the same thing with the driving forces. So here, once again, we want to look at what are the, each person's two most intense driving forces mm -hmm. and how are those going to help them relate or are they going to, you know, they need to be aware of that, not just assume that they have the same drivers and they can motivate each other the same way. Does the plan say, or does this report tell you, uh, potential good jobs that this employee fits into? No, no, but you'll know based on the behaviors and the driving forces, uh -huh. whether they're a fit with the role, because you know the needs of the role. Uh -huh. And if you don't know the needs of the role, you really should do, at least our approach is our employee strategic plans, because you really define the role there well, uh -huh. uh, because it includes the target goals, it includes the behavioral expectations, behavioral competencies, which are more formal behaviors. It includes um, a description of the work they do and how many hours are allocated to each type of work um, and a few other things. It also, by the way, asks them 
to define what do you want to learn next year? What do you want to learn the next the year after that? Right. Because I want this to be a plan for their success. And I never want to lose somebody because they said, well, I didn't think there was anywhere for me to grow in the organization. Yeah, totally. I was just talking to my son. He's 18. And I'm, I'm like, we got to think about a summer job. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, what do you want? Do you know what you want to do in life yet? Like, and he's like, I don't know. I'm like, well, let's find you something that you like doing. Marketing, is it technical, is this or that. So maybe we should uh, have him take this stuff so we can figure out what would be best for him. Yeah. And, and really, whether it's summer jobs, and I, I really think college students in particular, should be doing internships all the time until they figure out, oh, I really love this. Right. And do what you love. It's not a, your career should not be about money. It should be finding something you love to do. You know, be, learn how to be good with your finances. School won't teach you that. Right. Um, and, and then just go go live life and, and love life, love right. people, you know, type of thing which could could and should equate into getting the money, maybe, right? Like, you have well, a better chance but, of making money. But it may not. I mean, you may love working with wood <laughs> and you're going to max out at making like 60 grand a year or something like that. Right. But if you manage your finances well, you right. can still be very comfortable earning less money and being happy, you know? Right. it's it's uh, And having a fulfilling life, helping other people, right. et cetera. So this, this kind of gives you a glimpse of if you want to use talent assessments, a lot of organizations now as they've moved remote have realized, hey, I don't know my people as well as I thought. I'm not interacting with my people as much as we were. These talent assessments, great way to go because it's not only a one-time group exercise, but it gives you things you can apply for people to become better live more fulfilling lives and work more effectively with others and live more effectively with others outside. There's also other group ideas. Um, these are just a few, and I'll, I'll give, I gave you the deck that you can send to people afterwards. This Jeopardy game is a great idea. It takes a little work, and the, but there's the app you can use. This a client um, up in Rhode Island that's an MSP, Vertical Six, they use it with their tech team. They have like 300 clients. so the manager of the particular group work group chooses one client and he fills all the Jeopardy squares with information about the client. And then, you know, once a week they have lunch together. I don't know whether the company pays for it or not. And he spent about two hours putting together the game. They play the game. It's a lot of fun. They have laughter, you know, and they, they go through the game. And uh, but they also learn more about the client. You could do it where you're learning more about each other, testing each other on what you learned in the talent assessments. You could do it about other things. Um, there's a this couple weeks there. For, uh, right? Now holiday time. No, now holiday time. We normally get together with the staff and um, probably not going to be able to do that this year. But something some of these things could be cool for that and, and as a substitute. Yeah, I think the group idea is really the overarching concept here is that once a week, every two weeks, certainly no less than a month, but I would recommend no less than two weeks. You do something as a group activity. So you can see um, number five there, I've got a client, they just do a hangout like once a week. And uh, this, this client actually does it once a week. I don't think they buy dinner for them every week, but you could do it once a month. And you know everybody gets to order what they want within reason have it delivered to them. And so people get to talk about their food, what they ordered, and they're just hanging out. And the, the funny thing is with this particular company, because they have such a strong culture, which you know I, I contributed to, but I'm not, you know, I don't get all the credit. Um, the, everybody shows up and everybody stays two hours yeah. after work just to banter because they right. miss the banter and they enjoy it. Um, I say create a yearbook. This is a little bit of work, but Esther, this would be right up your alley. You know, maybe not for this year, but do it for next year. Start making certain for each month. You start taking photos and recording success stories, etc. Awesome. We're on it, David. We're on it. Yeah, so, but that's so, a really that's a fun thing, you know, um, that you could do with people. And maybe eventually we will meet again in person. Of course we will. And, uh, you know, you do a yearbook, you could do the yearbook signing thing like you used to do in high school or whatever. 
Yeah. It's just it's just fun and goofy stuff as well as serious stuff. Right. Um, by the way, a couple comments on this group ideas. It's not written in here. So this is a test for all of you. Make certain you're paying attention. This is more important than any group idea. Do not do group activities where you have one winner. Mm -hmm. Because often it's the same people who win. Uh -huh. And then it becomes, why would I want to go to that? So-and-so is just going to win. I'm never going to win. And it becomes subconsciously about the winning. So uh -huh. if you're going to do anything with prizes, do things where everybody wins. And it's not, this person's the best. It's like, all right, we all won. We all succeeded. All right. Okay? Makes but sense. please keep that in mind. I think a lot of companies overlook that. Um, I'm not an employee of the month guy. You probably gathered that. Yeah. I want to set up a structure in my organization where everybody simultaneously can be employee of the month. If we all hit our numbers, if we all do our metrics, everybody is employee of the month. And anybody who's not is getting my assistance so that next month they will be. Right. So Thanks. that would be one comment I would make. Awesome. Great stuff. I really like, uh, yeah, I know we're coming up on the hour, but like, um, just like all these things that you have here, they're, in, they're investments, right? They cost money, they take time, you're going to have people set it up, you're going to buy dinners, you're going to do X and Y, Z. We don't even do enough of it, to be honest with you, but would you say you get the money back somehow? And if so, oh, how? You get it back a hundred times or a thousand times. This is not a lot of money. Right. There is some time here. But it, it, my three strands leadership system is the first strand is systematic power. That's the foundation that holds everything up. Your systems for how you hire, manage, develop, retain, and also how you stay focused, how you make decisions, how you hold people accountable. There are seven key attributes of systematic power. The second one is meaningful work. I call that the, the center strand, the heart of everything you do. Meaningful work pumps lifeblood into your organization makes people want to get out of bed, work hard when you're not looking, come to work, that type of thing. And then the third one is sincere gratitude. This is what holds everything together. People want to know you value them as a team member. That's right. the purpose of these events. We value you. We enjoy you. We appreciate you. Somebody may not be exactly like you, right. but there's, there's ways that you can interact with them and engage with them. The talent assessments help. But find find areas of commonality that you can get along. And uh, remember, these are people that should be consistent with your company values. Correct. So you should have areas of commonality. If you don't, that's kind of a yellow flag either on you, that you got an issue you got to work on, right, or on them that you haven't addressed an issue they have. Yeah, I mean, for sure, we the, the core values exercise took us a good year plus it was a continual improvement process but um it's the cornerstone like for me it's like the cornerstone of, of people like you can't it just was eye-opening and game-changing and i'm so happy we invested the time to make it happen yeah now i'm sorry i wasn't watching the clock and, and we've been having too much fun talking i'm going to try to the next two sections are, are shorter because they build on the talent assessment stuff but I'm gonna to try to shoot through those pretty quick. Esther, do we have any questions before I dive into hiring? I don't see anything here. Um, I think we're hitting uh, a little bit of time, so go ahead, we'll, we'll try to zoom through this and um, I don't see any other questions yeah. just yet. But we'll wrap through it pretty quick. So, we'll, we'll wrap it up, yeah. So we're talking about talent assessments and how you can use them in hiring because most people don't. So what I like to say is everybody goes to a job interview with a hire me script. Hire me, hire me, hire me, I'm the best, okay? Um, so what I, there's a lot of pieces to the hiring system. I, I teach, I hire the best, avoid the rest system that I created myself. It's very thorough. It's very effective. People hire me every week to interview people that they're hiring. Okay. And all my clients are hiring right now. So, uh, I'm, I just went through some high level stuff here when they take our assessment. Okay. It happens after you've already done some qualifying. You can see that in item number one there, then the assessment. How they complete the assessment, do they do it on time? Do they follow the instructions correctly? Those type of things we take note of. We compare their profile, the results of the assessment, 
to what we have experienced as a superstar in the role. And we compare their profile of how this person is going to get along with their boss, their future boss, and the other members of the, of the team. And then we're going to ask them questions. Remember, I said, you take the assessment, they highlight certain statements in the report, and then they choose three that best describe them. We then look at, uh, we, we talk with them, I interview them or, or the client does, uh, usually it's me, and <clears throat> I, I explain the report to them. I walk through the key graphs. I talk to you about these, and then I'm gonna say, okay, you highlighted this statement that you can be resourceful even when faced with obstacles. You can see that's the second sentence that's highlighted. Can you give me an example of, of when you did that and what the result was? That's awesome. So I'm, I'm getting them out of their script and I wanna see how they think, okay? And I wanna learn more about them that's on, than the, something that's on the surface. So I might ask, I see you highlighted, he sets high sales goals for himself. Can you give me an example of that? The person gives me an example. And then I say, okay, so, um, have you set high sales goals and then never and then not achieve them? If they're going to be honest, most likely they're going to say yes. If they say no, that's kind of a yellow flag for me. If they say yes, then I'll say, okay, well, give me, tell me what happened when that's happened to you in the past. You set a high sales goal and then you didn't hit it. What happened? And I want to listen carefully. Did they adjust when they fell behind in a day or in a week, in two weeks, in a month? Or did it take a quarter before they took some adjustment or a year? So I'm going to listen for how they're going to, and I'm going to ask some more questions. Once again, I'm getting them talking outside of their hire me script. Really important. That's where the talent assessments also provide an additional value. And then there may be some statements. I interviewed this gal um, late last week and finished up this week, Alexis. And that actually is crossing off those statements, those red underlines. Uh -huh. So she disagreed that she seeks popularity and social recognition and that she may be inconsistent in disciplining others. And because of her trust and willingness, acceptance of people, she may misjudge the abilities of others. So sometimes when people cross off statements, it's a yellow flag because they answer the questions. These statements should be correct. But keep in mind, even though the PhDs put together these reports, they're not going to be like 100 percent intensely right. accurate. They're going to have some generalities. So I asked your questions about all three of these. And it doesn't happen often, but I liked their answers. I thought they were reasonable. And actually, overall, she was a superstar. So I, I recommended that she be hired. Okay. But, but the beauty about this, keep in mind, what I'm doing here is if I'm going to work with this person, I want to know how they think. It's great to know their behavioral you know, strengths and weaknesses and what's driving them and where they are with 25 soft skills. That's all very important. I don't wanna make a decision without that information. But also when I'm qualifying, when I'm interviewing, the main thing I'm looking for is how do they think? Because that's gonna tell me how they can do in the position. And there's a lot of other things we can talk about with hiring, but, um, Amazing. But this shows you how to use it in, in the assessment. Any questions on this at all? We do have a few. Um, oh, this is my Kiva. Can I get a copy of the PowerPoint? Much appreciated. Great stuff. Sure. Um, generally, we send it on request, but I think uh, there's such good content in here, David, and you're kind enough to share it. So I'll try to get this out to everybody on this webinar um, for those who want to read through it again and follow up. Um, and then from Corey. Do you find that people taking the test during an application process skew their answers based on what they think you want them to say? How do you know what their, that their preferred style is accurate? Great question. So we actually, in our instructions, we explain, we, we ask them to take the assessment and answer basically on their first thought. So there's a few ways people take these assessments. Most often, people take the assessment based on how they behave with the boundaries and habits that they develop based on their life experience, positive or negative. So they're answering fairly accurately. Sometimes they answer based on how they want to behave. And sometimes they answer and they try to, to jerry-rig the results, like you're saying. You know, like what answer do they want to see? Um, 
and sometimes they don't know themselves at all. And that'll that'll show up. This is why you don't just do interviews and no assessment. You don't just do assessment and no interviews. And you interview them based on the assessment. Mm -hmm. You don't just look at the numbers, the metrics, and say, oh, okay, you're a high D and blah, 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 blah. And okay, that looks like that's a match. That sounds like me. No. Don't no, do we that. don't do that. We're diving in. <laughs> We're diving in. I want to get to know you. So that's that, when you do that, there is also something on the disc side, the behavioral side, that most of the time when people try to cheat and answer a certain way, they can't be consistent and the system catches it. Yeah. And there's a warning page that's the first page on the assessment report that says right. this person had some inconsistent answers. Right. They should take it again or you should talk with them. Right. Awesome. Any other questions, Esther? No, it looks like that's that's about it. Um, okay, let me shoot through PIP. This will be real quick. Okay. Okay, performance improvement plans. First of all, here's my feeling. A PIP is not a, a, a an angry disciplinary punishment. A PIP is saying, hey, I'm coming alongside you. I wanna see you succeed. I wanna give you every opportunity to succeed. This is how we're going to do it. We need to agree on a plan because your behaviors in this area or your performance in this area are not meeting our standards. I want you to change from the guy on the left who's got some issues into the guy on the right who seems to have it much more together. And the truth of the matter is, I don't know a statistic on it, but if I were giving one, I would say more than 95%, if not 98 or 98%, 98 or 99% of companies that do performance improvement plans do a lousy job of them. They define them and they don't follow up on them. They don't use them effectively. They don't write them well. There's all kinds of problems. We're not going to dive into that. So um, it's the, the key thing with a PIP is um, applying the talent assessment helps you be more successful in it. Remember, you're going to know the strengths and weaknesses in their behaviors. You're going to know what drives them. You're going to know what their software skills are. So here are six questions you can ask because the PIP should not only say, we want you to achieve these metrics, okay? But they don't, should also say, these are the changes in your behavior we want to see so you can achieve those metrics. And oftentimes the PIP is missing that. Also, if you do performance improvement plans, let me, let me give you just a couple tips. The first one is, again, remember what I said earlier, develop the plan with the individual. Don't just assign it to them, okay? And do it in a, in a Q&A. So you're not meeting this metric. Um, you have to meet this metric. What type of behaviors do you think you need to do to achieve that metric. Try to get them to define it as much as possible so they'll own more of it. And then really the reason performance improvement plans fail is management, not the employee. Because number one, if the employee is not gonna succeed in the plan, don't waste your time and go through it. Number two, if they have the potential to maybe succeed in the plan, then you need to follow up daily for two to five minutes as a check-in for two weeks to make certain they're doing okay. And then every week, if not every few days, for the next, you know, for the next three weeks, so a full month, and then every week for the remaining weeks in that 90-day plan. Mm -hmm. There are too many people that define the plan, walk away from it, and look at it 90 days later and say, hey, you didn't achieve it. Well, the person, no. They have no feedback, they have no support. And the other thing you may want to do is you may want to have a mentor or, you know, uh, somebody on the team, a peer mentor, uh, kind of overseeing them, helping them also. Remember, the goal is to give them every opportunity to succeed. The, there's no guarantee they will succeed, but you want them to know sincere gratitude, the third strand of three strands leadership. You care about them, you value them, but maybe they're not right for the role. So then if they're not, we're going to help you transition out or we're just gonna to have to let you go immediately if it's a more serious issue. Right, yeah, it's so so much you could do with this stuff and we don't do enough of it in our organization, but it's just so powerful. David, I actually had a quick question, if that's okay. Uh, sure. Um, yes, um, just wanted to know, I imagine um, speaking from us as like a small business and probably others that are listening and some of our clients in the same category, what if you know, you're in a situation 
um, I know it's rare, but if it happens that you're maybe balancing multiple roles and you don't necessarily have, um, you know, just the performance management side of it to um, deal with, like, what's the, what's your tips for like managing this when you're also running a business or like how to um, balance it out from a time perspective, how much time is, is, is great to be able to give to this and what's the best way to do that? Um, so, so when I went, had my epiphany that I had leadership attributes, but no skills, what I realized was my primary problem, I was not systematic with leadership like I was in other areas of my work. So if you have a PIP system in place, and if you want, I'll give you my guide on how to do that, you then know what to do. So what you have to do is you have to sit down, you have to structure, you have, first of all, remember systematic power. It's how well you focus on what's most important, how you make tough decisions, and then how you hold people accountable and then the four management disciplines. So you have to make a tough decision. Is, does this employee have the capability to succeed in a PIP? If you did your hiring right, they should have the capability to succeed in the PIP, okay? But there may be a situation like, you know what? I don't think they're gonna do it. Then don't waste your time. Right. You just need to let them go, okay? You save, you save yourself so much money and aggravation and just, yeah, it's just, and you Sometimes. save them the same. Yeah. Save yeah. them being embarrassed, you know, or feeling bad because they didn't do something. So they don't have the yeah. time. If if you are commit, if you feel the person has the capability, you have the process in place. That's the big speed bump. Then you show them an example of a plan and you say, I want you to draft a plan. These are the areas where I need you to improve, and then let's meet and let's finalize it. The meeting should take you like a half an hour. But then the key is you need to meet with them regularly to follow up. Those daily check-ins, they're two to five minutes. If you can't spare two to five minutes, you've got time management problems. Would you okay. say that the, the PIP is impossible if the, the employee's not uh, meeting or living or aligning with your core values? If I would say it's impossible if they're not aligning with your core values and they refuse to change or there's something in their life that's gone on where subconsciously they are unable to change. Yes, yeah, so one interesting thing my uh, business coach once taught me about is this like A player versus B player concept, which was like, you know, you have skills and you have culture fit. And if the, if the employee is highly skilled, uh, but not such a great culture fit, they're a B player versus if the employee is highly aligned with your core values, but not so skilled, they're an A player, which was a, also a game-changing moment for me because you don't think of it that way. I used to interview based on engineering skills and not, you know, that was the first question I would ask is like, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you do that? What do you do if this happens? What do you do if that happens? I don't even talk about that anymore when I interview. Now it's just like, what's important to you? What's, who's gonna be you know, the guy I'm sitting next to and I'm gonna, am I going to just feel totally uncomfortable being next to them because we're not aligned? So, like, is that, would you agree with that? Well, so, I mean, we're talking in broad strokes. There is a time in the interview, the qualif qualification process, where you have to test the skills, the hard skills. Um, and there is a time where you have to test the soft skills, the behavioral side. But as you say, a starting point early on in the interview process, and you can even do it in the phone screen, is that, and, and hiring the whole hiring system thing's totally different, but the um, you do need to confirm the cultural fit and that it's not just being talked to like, oh yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Right. But you're asking for examples. You know, our yeah. value is X. Can you give me an example on how you live that out? And if they give some example that you think is pretty lightweight, you know, may not be a fit because they don't really understand it at the depth you're looking for. Whereas yeah. if you give them, you ask for an example and they give you this example and you're like, wow, then you, you got something that's much more interesting. Yeah. I also feel like if they are aligned with the core values, the skills are very easy to teach. I mean, it depends yes, but, on the person. But, but, as part of, but as part of the test drive, when you're, you're qualifying them, you need to teach them something and see how well they can learn it and apply it. Mm -hmm. Okay, because in theory, 
if the culture fit is there, you can teach the soft skills and the hard skill. But right. you need to test that when you're qualifying people in the hiring process that, yes, they can not just nod their head that they get something, but right. they actually can receive some information and then turn around and apply it. Yeah, it's great stuff. Great stuff. Sorry, I, I went over. Hitting. All good. I think let's take one more question we have in the audience. Oh, sorry, Jeff. No, no. I was just going to say, uh, I only saw one person drop off since we started, so it must be interesting. Yeah, I have <laughs> well, uh, one more one more question we'll take because we're hitting the end, but um, David's been kind enough to make himself available. Like Jeff said, we've, we've worked with him five years ago and have been in touch since. He's always been so helpful, so I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, help offline after if you have follow-up questions. Um, but one last question from Rogers. Is there a difference between PIP and performance watch? And performance what? Watch. I'm not sure what's between PIP and performance watch. Rogers, I'm going to actually unmute you in case you want to maybe just if you're able to define, unless David, you know what performance watch is. I'm not familiar with performance watch. Rogers, if you want to unmute yourself, you definitely can. And um maybe tell us a little bit more. Otherwise, hopefully we can help you out after um, with that question, but thank you for submitting it. So did I get that right? As you said, everyone can take the assessments. Is that, yeah, so is if, that you have not worked with, if, if, you have not, if you have not worked with us previously, um, we let you take our full triple perspective assessment. We do the full thing with the summary, the cubicle sign, and even show you a recommendation of, um, how to work best with you. Probably what we'll do instead of doing the full email written one, I'll get on the phone with you and I'll walk you through the report. So it takes about a half an hour to walk through it or so. Um, and just yeah. so you can experience it. And I would, um, I would you know, take if, Dave up you know, on this offer because honestly, this thing changed the direction of my life for the better. Yeah. And by the way, um, what you can do is if, if you're thinking about it, you can take it for yourself because you want to gauge it for yourself. Or you can give it to a superstar because you want to clone that person. Or you can give it to somebody in your organization who you think has the potential to turn around, but you haven't been able to figure it out yet. And you'd like to know, how can I work better with this person? Or if you're hiring, you can give it to somebody you're hiring. And I'll even look at it and I'll make a quasi, you know, I think this person fits for the role or, or not recommendation. So you can use it any way you want. We're not, you know, limiting that. But if if you haven't worked with us, you, you can get one for free and, and they're very helpful. Very, very helpful. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, I guess uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, David, thank you so much again for yeah. sharing your time and expertise with us. This is awesome. I've been sitting here taking notes and uh, hopefully hope to implement a lot of what you talked about and learn more from you following. Um, so thank you so much for that. A couple of thank yous from the audience. And then before we uh, break, I just want to mention that if you're interested in this, this topic and um, a lot of what David talked about, and um, we're having another amazing speaker, Merrick Rosenberg, that's on January 28th at 2 p.m. Um, hopefully, you'll all join us again for that one. He's going to go a little bit more in depth on the this stuff um, and talk further about similar topics. So, really hope you all join us. Um, Jeff, David, thank you so much for your time, thank and you. hopefully, we'll see you all see you all that's soon. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thank so thanks much. everybody. Honor to be thank here. You. Take care. Okay. Bye bye.